that'll be useful. Um, hi, everyone. It's Sasha here from Coding Rooms, joining you again for our weekly podcast. Today, I'm joined by uh, Lisa Ryder and Tara Krish from the Conejo Valley Unified School District. They're both computer science teachers that started out as math teachers, and that's our topic for the day, going from math teacher to full-time CS teacher. Um, why don't we just get things started? Lisa, if you could tell us about your journey, how things started, and where, where you're at now, that'd be awesome. Thanks, Sasha. Um, so both Tara and I teach, we actually are both still math teachers and computer science teachers. Um, so I started teaching computer science probably, I wanna say nine or 10 years ago. We had one computer science teacher at the time who was teaching one period of AP Computer Science A, and she decided to retire, even though she's like my age. She's a very good friend of mine, and she decided she was going to do something else, and so she left teaching, and she kind of left this hole of who should teach uh, AP Comp Sci A, and you know, a lot of uh, us were asked, and originally I said, there's no way I can do this. I had never even taken a computer science class. I went to college in the early 90s when some people were still using typewriters to type their English papers. Um, I went to a small liberal arts college and there was no computer science classes at my college. I know at the time in the early 90s there were colleges that had computer science classes, but not mine. So I had never even experienced it. But um, this friend of mine who retired, she convinced me that I could probably do this and that I should do it and that I would love it. So I took a community college class in our local area, uh, a Java class, and um, tried to learn <laughs> Java in a semester. And then the following fall, I took on teaching the computer science A class. And um, it was definitely crazy at the time I was, you know, that was 10 years ago. I was obviously the only one in my school who knew even a little bit about computer science. And in my school district, there was, you know, at the other two high schools, there was um, not, there was only one other teacher doing computer science A. And I didn't really know that teacher. I didn't really talk to him. So I felt like I was pretty much just like an island on my own. And there's a lot of struggles with that just because you just don't know what you're doing. Um, just getting like a development environment an IDE to like run in the computer lab correctly, working with my site tech, anytime things would go wrong, neither of us like had anybody to ask, like, how do we make this work? How do we fix this? Um, just like so many things like that. Um, after I'd done that, for a couple years and felt like it was somewhat successful. Um, I did have some students who felt like jumping in at that level was a little bit like jumping into the deep end, like learning object-oriented programming as your first language seemed to be really a struggle for a lot of kids. So at one of the other high schools, they were teaching a programming one class. And I asked that teacher what she was doing. She was doing visual basic, which I had never heard of. But that was the books, that was the class we had on record. So I said, let's try and offer this class. So we brought into that class and I learned Visual Basic while I taught it. And I think that once you know your first language, everything kind of goes much easier. But again, there was just like issues with, you know, Visual Basics running in Visual Studio and getting that to work. And really, although I had this other teacher, it was still like difficult to <clears throat> find just any kind of collaboration, you know, I just felt alone. Um, but eventually they, the state of California and our county got involved with career tech education and computer science kind of falls into that and started creating, you know, groups around that. So I started slowly making connections with other people in the county who were teaching and just feeling like I just had a little bit more support. And then um, computer science principals came around and I said, we should offer that. I had students who were finishing CompSci A and still at school. And they said, we still wanna learn more computer science. So we offered a independent projects class after that. So, you know, now we have, um, I guess, four different computer science classes available at our school. And it really has grown from, you know, 
the one period of CompSIA that I inherited to this, you know, full offering of classes to the point where I couldn't teach them all. And um, I kind of would always say to other math teachers, hey, you guys, you should get in on this because here's the cool difference between teaching computer science and teaching math. Students have to take math. That's like a required class. And there's this added pressure on us that they have to take state testing and SATs and everybody super cares about the grade in math and what curriculum we're doing. There's like so many eyes on you and hands in what you're doing that you just feel pretty restricted as a math teacher. And computer science, nobody knows what you're doing because you're the only one who knows what's going on. And it's an elective. And um, the kids who choose to take computer science are usually pretty um, creative and interesting and bright kids. And it's just a totally different world to teach to that kind of room than kids who are like, why do we have to learn this, you know? So I kept saying to math teachers, like, who wants in on this? Like, this is a great thing. And finally, Tara came along. <laughs> Tara um, joined Westlake High School. I don't know, Tara, when did you join Westlake High School? 2014. 2014. So she's been yeah. here for six years. And she actually taught our computer applications class, I think, I the did. first year, yeah. which is My not in the year. math department, no. but they needed someone to teach that. And then she kind of said, yeah, like, I'm really interested in this kind of stuff. So I'm like, hey, you're going to teach this class with me. We just started a, uh, an algebra class called Algebra for the 21st Century that involved some programming. I'm like, do this with me. And we did. So I'll let you <laughs> Tara, tell your little version of your story, how you came, yeah. how I made you join my crazy <laughs> yep. brain. That's how it works. Lisa says, do this with me. And I say, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I have a technical theater background. So I never took a computer science class, but I was always doing something with a light board or a sound board or, or um, with uh, stage management. Um, so I uh, work at a theme park in the area and I was fortunate enough to um, open one of their um, shows and I got to be part of, you know, um, creating the, the operating procedures for my particular role. And we got to work with a programmer on making the user interface that we were going to use to run the show. And I remember um, being like just fascinated by how he could say, well, where do you want this button? And then we'd say, well, I think we should have this button here. And can you make it like always live? And then he'd just do something in the computer and oh, there's the button and it's live. And, and I'm like, what are you doing? And so I remember asking him like, what does the code look like? And he kind of laughed at me because I don't think he understood what I meant. And he was like a young guy. So he's probably like, how do you not know what a code looks like? But I had literally no idea what a programming language was or anything like that. And I was really interested, but I was like, I don't know how to do this. And then Lisa came and said, I wanna teach this Algebra 2 class. It's gonna have programming in it. You're gonna come with me and we're gonna learn how to program. And so the first year that we, we taught it, you know, she would help me because I'm like, what is a string? I don't, what are you talking about? And she would write me some notes and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, wait, I understand this. This is, this is actually kind of cool. Um, and then, you know, we got to work with like, we used robots or we were going to use robots before we, we got shut down. Um, so then it was, well, I want to teach kind of more of these computer science classes. And then Lisa said, well, you should teach the AP computer science principles class. So I ended up taking a professional development course over summer um, and kind of got thrown into um, that, you know, the new, like, what is it, the new kind of format that they have now and on it. But because I taught, I said I would teach that class and then we, you know, the pandemic hit and our schedules all changed. And so all of a sudden um, I was the only one that could teach um, based on the scheduling of classes, the C++ class and the programming one class. So um, this year I ended, my up, fault. <laughs> I ended up teaching C++ and I almost had to teach computer science A, but luckily Lisa took that one back. Um, 
So it's been really fun. I've just been thrown into Python and C++. Um, but the more I do it and I, the more I'm learning with the students, the, the more it makes sense. I remember in the summer going, what the heck is this uh, when I was trying to do Python? Like, I don't know what I'm doing. And then all of a sudden, like, oh, now this, this totally makes sense. And like Lisa said, once you know one language, you can kind of pick up the other languages a little bit quicker. So it's been fun trying to learn it with the students sometimes. Um, but coding rooms has helped tremendously because, you know, I can watch what they're doing and sometimes they do something and I'll like, oh, what, what are they doing? And, and um, I can ask Lisa, like, what are they doing in here with this stuff? Um, or, you know, I can share my screen. So, cause some kids have never coded before at all. Um, so, they're kind of intimidated and I'm allowed, I'm able to like show mine or they can compare mine with theirs. And so that's been helpful a lot too um, with trying to teach in this situation that we're in. Awesome, awesome. That's always great to hear. Um, I, I'm really interested to know, um, what was it like to pick up uh, your first programming language with the, um, knowing knowing that in I don't know what was it maybe three to six months you're going to have to teach it to people who are in um, are kind of at the same stage that you are uh, at that given moment um, because I think that that's unique to how um, I you know if, if you know, when I'm in a CS class I, I think the thought process is a little different right I'm, I'm purely interested in knowing the task at hand like how to program in Java, but I don't think at all about, okay, and then in six months, I'm gonna be teaching this to someone else who knows as much or less than, than I do. Um, so I'm curious, what, what else is involved in, in, um, in that process? Um, either either uh, Lisa or Tara, if, 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 um, if you have any thoughts on that. I feel like it for, like when I was first sitting in the classroom learning Java, I definitely had that fear, like, how, how, like the, how, how am I going to get to the point where I feel confident that I understand this enough to explain it to my classes, you know, and Tara probably, maybe I don't know if she is intimidated, is intimidated by me, but like I had a degree in math, I majored in math. So I was never like fearful of teaching a math class because I'm like, I know math, like, give me any math, I can figure it out. But it definitely was a moment of like, oh, this is different. This is a lot different. Um, I just, a, it definitely was very time consuming. But at the same time for me, and maybe this is true about Tara, I was so fascinated by programming. Like my, when I sat in that class, I was like, this is so awesome. Like the logic involved and the creativity involved in writing a program to me is just so awesome. So even though I felt like intimidated, I was also so fascinated and excited about it that I was like wanting to share my little bit of tiny bit of knowledge that I have um, with the students. But I definitely made it very clear the first year, like, hey, you guys, I, I'm like really literally a week ahead of you. <laughs> like what I'm teaching to you right now, like I really, I think I understand it and I think I get it, but I think just having that, giving them that honesty the first year that I taught it, a lot of the students were super patient with me. They were excited to have the opportunity to have this class because they understood that the teacher had left Westlake no one else had taken this on. I had taken it on. I mean, they were very understanding of like, the only way that this class exists is Miss Ryder's teaching it to us and we're gonna be patient with her. And there were definitely times that I, you know, I had some really, really, and you do, you have really bright kids. I mean, I definitely would say I, have on any given year, a majority of the class is much smarter than I am. And, and there are times that you teach kids that know a lot more than you. And I think if you approach it just like, I'm trying my best and I'm like, I will defer, you know, to you if you think you know something. And I've always had kids who would like 
step in and very politely and very respectfully help me explain something or tell me something or teach me something new. And that happened, that happens to me almost every year. And I've just kind of like, you have to shift a little bit from being a math teacher who, who like having a degree in math, I feel like I always know more math than any kid in my classroom to being in a role of like, Hey, maybe a lot of these kids know more than I do. And just being like more of a cheerleader guider of, Hey, we don't know something. Let's look it up. I mean, and that's, I think one of the cool things about teaching computer science is the answer is out there between like Stack Overflow or a million other sites where people share their thoughts and knowledge, you can like look stuff up and get answers. So um, I think that that's a helpful skill for the kids to learn as well. So I always felt maybe it was better that I didn't know because I would say, let's go ask, let's go ask the internet what they think. And I think that guidance of showing kids how to be like lifelong learners is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And that's truly unique to CS, right? Um, Definitely. I, and and I, I was just about to ask, like how, um, and, and you, you alluded to this um, earlier, but it's, it, it's really uniquely demanding, I guess, in computer science because the um, subject matter is pretty, I, I would say, um, un, unbounded. In, in the sense that it, it not not only is the depth um, far beyond what any one person could ever know, but it's also changing so rapidly. For sure. So <laughs> it's really weird, even when you're just talking about basic Java, like basic Java programs 10 years ago were not really the same as um, sort of anything even just marginally more complicated than Hello World. Uh, can be written differently today than you could have written it 10 years ago just because the versions of Java have changed. And um, I, I wonder how that, that um, plays into your first year teaching um, because th there are so many different ways to do things, but at, at some point there's a, a standard that all students must meet. Um, how do you actually balance like, that gap between folks who are kind of just barely trying to, to make the standard versus people who are um, building um, you know, on, on the robotics team, building uh, autonomous rovers or whatever. You know, it, 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 to, to me, it sounds like a really challenging problem. Here in C++, uh, I had that. I have some kids that have never even, you know, they don't know Python. They, don't, they haven't taken any computer science courses. And then I have some kids that know what I feel like is almost every computer language imaginable. So, um, you know, I'm in the boat with, you know, the kids that haven't really coded very much and, and don't know that many programming languages. And so I kind of um, make, I give them different options because so, I don't want, I don't want any kid to feel overwhelmed because I do know what that feels like. Um, and I don't want them to like give up and think that they can't do it anymore if it does happen to get difficult. So when I give them assignments, I usually like make them select from um, a certain number of possible challenges that we have in the textbook that we use. Um, and then, you know, based on its difficulty or what I feel like its difficulty is, you know, they only have to um, get a certain number of points and I'll assign different point values to those. So some kids just love to program and they will do, if I set all, if I set 10 out, they'll do all 10. And it's like, okay, that's fine. Cause you just love to do it and you want the challenge and you'll get, you know, the, you'll meet the um, criteria. And usually I will just reward them with a couple of extra points for exceeding expectations. And then there are some that's like, I can only do like the, the most basic ones. And to me, that's perfect because that's what they feel comfortable with. Um, and I don't, I want them to feel like, look what I just did. I, this is hard and I was able to do it. And so then maybe next time they'll want to do, you know, a, a more, a higher point value one. Um, I feel like I have been sitting watching, like you, um, I use, what is it? The Harvard CS50X 
videos on YouTube. And sometimes I'm like, okay, I need to pause this because I can't handle what he's talking about anymore. And I feel like um, I structure the class that way. Like I don't want to give them too much all at once because then they'll, you know, their eyes will gloss over and go, I forgot everything that you just said. So it's that balance of making sure that you're not shoving too much in their face and then giving those that are ready for that challenge a chance to really like see what they can do with it. And during class, um, did, does it frequently come up like the students suggest to do something in a different way? Um, how do you handle that as like a, a first year teacher who might not really know um, what, what that specific thing is or have heard of that way to do it? Um, that, that sounds like it, it could, could, could lead to some challenging conversations. I usually just say, well, this is what the book says. <laughs> but if you know, that works too. <laughs> like I kind of just let them explain what they feel is correct and just kind of let them like put it out there. Let the rest of the class hear what your idea is. And if I've never heard of it, I'm like, that's, thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> that's kind of how I handle mm -hmm. it because I don't necessarily know what they're saying is true. I see. And I then think the, um, yeah. in our C++ class, we have a lot more freedom of the way things work. You know, in the AP Compsci A class, you know, there's like very specific curriculum. And sometimes there's very specific ways that College Board is expecting them to solve problems. So it's, you know, sometimes you just kind of have to steer them into like, yeah, you could definitely do it this way, but this is what they're going to be looking for on the AP test. And, you know, that to me, that's a little unfortunate, but that's, you know, that's just the reality of the situation of teaching that class. Um, so that's why it's kind of exciting to have the C++ class to have a little bit more freedom to allow students to, you know, have these alternate ways of doing things. Um, I think that happens even if you're not a first year teacher. Like I always have students tell me a different way to do something. And I'm always kind of excited to see what that is and figure it out. And like you were saying, it, everything's changing all the time. So, you know, what I think I know about Java might not be correct today, you know, it was correct five years ago, you know, and, the, and they might know stuff. So I'm always want to encourage that. I think it, um, for a lot of teachers, it might put you in an uncomfortable position of being the learner, <laughs> the learner. Sometimes, you know, we're not always used to that. Uh, we want that authority, but I think um, it, it helps you grow a little bit as an educator to be in the, that seat a little bit. And like I've said, I've always felt the kids have done it respectfully and politely and have never been trying to be like, you don't know what you're doing, Miss Ryder. They're always very like, hey, what about this thing? And, and um, I think if you just kind of like um, respond to them in a way that's not defensive and is just open to that, then that's a really great, you know, learning opportunity for, for everybody. I also feel like the kids who have a lot of knowledge always want to share it. And it's exciting um, in a normal year. It's really hard right now in the remote learning situations, but in a classroom, you could have them walk around and help students who are struggling and maybe talk to kids as they're programming. Now you got a helper, you know? I see. And um, we talk a lot about this um, um, sort of um, uh, scope of knowledge and the Dunning-Kruger effect, like the, the, the basically gap between um, self-perceived um, knowledge or skill and actual knowledge or skill. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's particularly funny in computer science and um, I think I, I, I see it um, depending like how much you zoom into your own program experience or my program experience. And I, even when I review code that um, I wrote last year, I <laughs> sometimes think, oh, wow, that was, but at the time I probably thought that that was a really genius solution. Um, so so I, I'm interested to know how, how, you, how do you um, deal with students who um, perceive themselves to have a, um, particularly, let's say, elevated um, proficiency um, in programming, um, but in fact, um, struggle um, with, with the basics. Because um, that's a topic that's been coming up a lot, uh, I feel like. 
for me, it's always been very interesting to me, um, especially when I'm trying to get more girls involved. Because when you brought that up, the thing that I see a lot between the girls and the boys in my classes is kind of what you talked about. The girls, a lot of times, are amazing. And they're getting A's on their tests and they're doing their programs. But if you ask them, they'll tell you that they don't, they're not very good. They'll say, I'm not very good at coding. And you're like, what, what are you talking about? Like you're getting an A in the class, you get like top scores on the tests. And they just sort of like, I think there's this, I don't understand why it's gender related, but I think there's a feeling your first year or first couple of years of coding that you don't really know what you're doing. And you're typing what you know you know is correct, but you don't really have the deep enough knowledge to understand why that is. You know, you type system that out to print, you don't really know what that is, but you just know that's what works. And I think for some reason, the girls, it makes them feel like, yeah, I can get an A in the class, but I don't really know what I'm doing, so I'm not very good at coding. And I've been always like, it, sort of upsets me a little bit because I don't know how to fix that. And at the same time, I'll have these boys who are getting like a C minus in the class and write this crazy code, you know, they'll do crazy stuff and they'll be like, I'm really good at coding. I'm a really good coder. And I'm like, well, you know, okay. <laughs> but it's bizarre to me, like that confidence level, like where do they have it? And um, I remember the first year I taught AP Comp Sci, I had this student who struggled and struggled. And I think he ended up with like a D plus in my class. And two years later, he's telling me like, I'm working for, like he, I think he went to community college, got out of school, started working at a startup. This was like 10 years ago and was doing all this coding. And I was like, wow, like I'm so impressed that this kid was never dismayed enough to like give it up. Like he just wanted to do it. He thought he was great at it. And now he has like a great career at it. Like, I don't know if getting a D in your first computer science class is a good judge of what you're going to do in your life. Like, I don't know. It's fascinating to me. And um, so I don't know. I don't know how to fix either of those problems. And I don't know if I need to fix the problem of the kid who has a lot of confidence, unless maybe you see it in your world where you have people maybe coming to work for you who think they're really good coders and actually don't know anything. I don't know that side of it, but it seems to me that the ones who have a lot of confidence sort of find their way one way or another. And I really want to find a way to help the students who are really good, who for some reason don't have confidence, find their way as well. And that's to me the problem that I want to fix. Um, and I don't know how to do that. And, I'm, I, and like I said, I'm a little worried that it, it tends to be the girls. So I don't know, Tara, what do you feel? I don't, I don't <laughs> you know, Lisa. that at all this year? <laughs> um, I've definitely seen some overconfidence. Um, and I just can, all I can do is just like, try to explain what I feel like makes sense to me or ask them like, well, why do you think that it should be this way? And, and try to just see if they understand, you know, why they think that one way is right when it might not be right. Um, a lot of times it's just asking that question or, well, this is what I think. And, you know, they know that I'm a first time learner and I try to model that like, um, you know, I'm learning this too. Um, and it's more of like kind of a collaborative situation, which I feel is good for them to experience as well. Like, yes, I'm a teacher, but we're all here to learn. Um, and I'm the oldest, so I'll just take the managerial role kind of thing. So mm -hmm. um, it's more just explain it to me. Um, and I'm going to explain to you what I think. And then we kind of have this dialogue. And then usually they'll just change their ways. <laughs> but not all the time. Sometimes they're just like, oh, I'll just do it this way. It's like, okay, okay. Maybe, maybe, and the, maybe they're right. And maybe they'll realize, oh, you know what? I shouldn't do it this way, whatever the situation is. So Sasha, I thought it was interesting that you asked that question. So what drives you to ask that question? Do you see people in your field that are overconfident a lot? Um, I, I've, I've heard it a lot from teachers. I think oh. especially where 
where APCSA is the first class that someone takes and they come in with a lot of knowledge. Um, you can have like, and, and, and there, are, there, there are definitely different flavors to this problem, right? Like, like one, one flavor is, and, and the sort, sort of most vanilla one of them is, is that they, they've coded a little bit of Java on their own um, and they, they think that they can build apps and, and actually um, that's uh, not even really part of the APCSA curriculum. So you kind of um, have done a couple of YouTube tutorials and you do it that way. And that's totally not how it, uh, it works in APCSA. And um, I, I know sort of from my personal experience, I uh, didn't take the AP CSA class, um, but I did take the exam. And I felt that problem because I also um, thought, okay, well, I know how to code in Java, which I, which I, I to, to be fair, I think I did. Um, but then when it came to actually preparing for the exam, I, I by chance, I thought, okay, I only have two weeks for the AP exam. I should probably open the textbook. Um, and I just realized, oh my God, I really don't know anything. Um, and so I, I've experienced that myself. Um, and, and, and truthfully, I could build an app in Java, but I could not build a bubble sort implementation off the top of my head. Um, because th those are completely different problem domains, but then we just shove them all under computer science. Um, so I, and that, that, that's been my personal experience. Um, and then um, the other one is just different languages. So it's maybe you took APCSP and you learned some JavaScript. So now you think you're so much ahead of everyone else, but truthfully, not, not by much, uh, probably. Um, and, and, and then um, the, the, the other one is, is, is a little more um, interesting where I'm sort of, as, as a programming language learner, um, you might have a lot of success initially, but then a lot of the concepts bring in um, other skills that, where you might be really weak. So you could start fantastically and have this um, sort of um, overstated confidence, uh, but, but then very, very quickly fall into this sort of valley of despair where you have really no idea what's going on. Um, and um, I feel like I've experienced that with different technologies and, and sometimes I just abandon something if I get too deep into that and I don't really have the right resources. Um, and then outside of CS classes, I feel like there are different um, uh, sort of variations on this problem where, where um, th there's this interesting book called um, Mythical Man Month um, that's kind of, I guess, recommended reading for most um, folks who end up pursuing like software development as a career. Um, and I, I, I wanna say it's in that book that there's this like second system effect or second system problem, I forget what it's called, but um, basically that the first system you build will be really bad and you know it's really bad because it's your first system. And so you expect it to be bad um, and, it, and it is, and then you throw it away. Um, the second system is um, you, you, you think that you've learned everything now since you built your first system and it was bad and you know why it was bad. And so you fix those things. Uh, and then you end up with a really, really, really bad system um, that also took way longer to build because you spent so much time fixing everything. Um, and then your confidence completely destroyed you build your third system. Um, and that one's actually much closer, at least to, to what you really need to build. And it's, it's um, you would, you would um, predict the quality of the third system to be much better. And I know I have personally felt that um, a lot of times. And I, I feel it in, a, in different scales, like we can build an entire project or I can build an uh, implementation of an algorithm um, and, 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 and really see that it's really the third iteration <laughs> where things get less bad. Um, and, and then sort of, I think I was, I was reading a psychology book or something. Um, I, I've never taken a psychology class. I'm sort of interested. And I came across Dunning Kruger. I'm like, okay, well, these, these are actually things that, that we experience in the software world a lot. Um, and and um, it, it, it's the other really weird thing is that CompSci is such a broad, um, broad um, uh, subject area. Um, and then even at the low levels of you know, building web applications, for example, the scope of knowledge is so enormous. Um, to, to where you're, 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 you're by definition always learning. Um, and the, the only people who survive in software, as far as I'm aware, who don't learn are just people who built up enough 
domain knowledge and are lucky to have learned something that, um, you know, let, let's say for example, a bank that, that never changes some system just keeps using, <laughs> right? But, but otherwise, unless you're in one of those relatively niche areas and you can't just write off of your own domain knowledge, learning a lot of really big complicated things is totally inherent to, to, to the job. Um, and and the, there's a sort of survivorship bias that occurs in computer science where um, a lot of the people who are in um, software jobs today are like the people who survived first year CS. <laughs> and that's a very specific type of person and it skews male, it skews a certain type of, um, of even race, um, you know, that there's a lot of different reasons that it skews that way. Um, and um, you know, partially is like availability of comp sci courses and whatnot. But, but I've, I found that interesting just because these problems don't, they don't come up once. They come up very, cons very consistently. Um, and so I, th I thought it would be interesting to, to speak to. And definitely one other thing that came to my mind was I would, I would conjecture that your second year teaching might actually be the hardest <laughs> because now not, not only you kind of lose the advantage of learning as you go, which means you remember how hard it was to learn. Um, but then you, you, you also think you're really good at teaching now, <laughs> but, but you're probably not because you've only been doing it for, 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 for a, a year and, and some change. Um, I, I wonder if you've experienced that. I remember when um, my friend who retired, who handed the class over to me, she had been teaching CompSci for probably like 10 years. And she said something to me like, every year I learn something new and I learn to teach a different way. And I was like, what? That's nuts, you know, because in math, it doesn't really change very much. I mean, geometry is geometry, geometry. And I was just thinking about that other, the other day as I was like planning my lesson for CompSci A, I was like, oh my God suddenly like I understood something that I had never understood before. And you know, this is like 10 years into teaching it that um, like, I always feel like it's that I have to treat it like I don't know everything. So I've never felt like I know everything when I teach that class. I definitely feel like I know it much better and I understand it much better, but um, I'm always, going to do something different and something new every year. And that's one of the things that I actually really like about it. And I think maybe that's one of the things that scares other teachers from teaching it. But I've always been a teacher who's wanted to not just like do the same thing every year. Like I always want to try something new. And, um, you know, I'm, al I'm almost a little disappointed that we've been doing Java for so long in CompSci A. I thought by now they might update the language and it would throw it all into disarray. We would all have to like do something new. Um, I think what's kind of exciting about principles is that there's no set language. And so you could change every year um, and do whatever you want. And they have already updated the curriculum. So that class is just constantly in motion. Like, you know, you're just always changing for that class, but now I don't even remember what the question was. <laughs> I, I feel like it's, I think I remember it's about, was it hard? Is it hard, you know, because it's year. the second year? The second year is harder. I don't and even I'll let remember. You know next year. <laughs> <laughs> I think for Tara, I feel bad for Tara because this year in particular is hard for everybody just because we've all had to change what we do in the remote situation. So to have to do it in this year, as well as learn Python and C++ and try to teach remotely um, is pretty amazing. Tara's been amazing this year. But I did want to plug a little bit your coding rooms because I think for us this year, having to move from a physical classroom where we can look over our students' shoulders and see what they're doing while they're programming into a remote situation where we didn't have that. And then all of a sudden coding rooms appeared. I don't even know how we, how I came into my view, but I was like, this is the answer. Um, being able to like 
see what kids are doing while they're doing it and see a bunch of kids at once and being able to show them our screen and look at their screen has been like the life saving thing of this year. And the other thing that has been huge, and I was talking to Tara about this the other day, was the support that you guys have. You, you were talking about how you have this 24 seven support and being a comp sci teacher, like I said, sometimes you're the only one in your school, maybe you're the only one in your district. Nobody can answer your question. You know, when you're first learning to set up your assignments in whatever way you're doing them, um, it's kind of scary. But the when just the other day when I was setting up an assignment in coding rooms and I was like, I don't know what's going on here. Chat, chat, chat. And surprisingly, it was you, Sasha. <laughs> I was like, Sasha, um, there you were, like to just help me and answer my questions. It was so just, um, it's just so reassuring that you're not alone um, trying to maneuver through this difficult time here. But even if, if you're like a first time teacher or the first time even using coding rooms, um, you know, like it's not scary at all. It's so helpful. And I, I hope that you guys keep that support there because that is huge. That's really awesome to hear. Uh, thank you. Um, we invest really heavily in that. So um, we're, we're also working to scale it and figure out how to um, like internal tooling to make, uh, to, to make individual um, people who man support uh, more effective um, and uh, we're building a lot of help resources and stuff as well. But I can definitely um, not so much from the teaching perspective, because the first time that I ever, ever taught any programming, um, and I, I haven't formally taught, I've always done um, like volunteer teaching, um, different workshops, um, which is interesting because you, you kind of always get like some kind of interesting new flavor of teaching, I, I guess, um, and a lot of different um, odd, sometimes less than ideal environments. Um, and, and so that, that, that idea of being on your own as a learner is also really challenging. And, and, and I think that there's um, might be a lot of um, similarities between you know, learning programming and feeling like you're on an island and, and teaching feeling like you're on an island. And I, I think especially if you're combining those two where you're, 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 you're learning yourself and then you're also teaching people, I know that, that, that that's a great, and then put, put COVID on top of it. That's, that's, that's tough. Um, and so, so we're really excited that that helps people. Um, and and I, I think that um, we're also really excited to provide more resources for teachers, um, like you know the the, the pre-built assignments um, and things like that that can provide a, a great starting point um, for for educators to build um, that their own curriculum on top of um, has been something that's. Been, been really um, exciting for us at Coding Rooms. Um, and then it, it's also interesting to see um, the actual idea behind Coding Rooms um, came out of teaching workshops where um, I always felt like I was kind of screaming into the void, um, which I, I, I feel like that term isn't used enough. Um, in, in, in teaching circles. And, and I always, I, I, and I definitely used to chalk it up to me just being a bad teacher in the beginning. And, and um, that, that, that's part of why I thought maybe the second year is actually harder because it, it, if you only teach after you, well, let's say know, know everything or, or you feel like you have a good grasp on things, things that are, are completely obvious, just you, you, you really lose touch of how non-obvious they are to anyone who isn't a, also a developer. Um, and, and isn't maybe familiar with specific tool that you're teaching. And so it was always funny to, to teach, um, you know, a short lecture, 30, 60 minutes, then go, go around the classroom and realize, oh my God, there has been roughly zero um, uh, <laughs> learning happening. <laughs> um, and, and it's not because people weren't visually engaged or making eye contact. I was kind of trying to check all the, the, the basic um, boxes, but programming is really hard. And, and I think that there's there is something very unique about programming, and I'm sure to a certain extent math, um, about how abstract it is and how um, 
meaningless and also powerful it is. Like code, like I can throw away code and not feel bad about it. Um, and and the, the, there's there's something to to that idea of code is is nothing but also everything. But it, it, it's and it's so so abstract for for new people to grasp. I mean, even Tara, your point at the very beginning about like what is code, what does it look like? I mean, still sometimes to this day I'm kind of look look in awe at code that I've written that other people have written. And think uh, it's pretty crazy, but also like it's nothing I and mean, it's just bits somewhere on a disk. Um, and I, I'm sure there's there are people who can. <laughs> probably provide more of a philosophical um, like uh, take on, on, on programming. Um, I'm sure I'm sort of barely scratching the surface. But I think that, 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 that that's part of the wonder of coding, but also part of what makes it really challenging. Um, I wonder what are um, your opinions on CS teacher certification? And maybe if you can share a little bit about what it was like um, for you and maybe maybe Tara, if you can go first, like you're probably the most recently certified or what most recent entrant. So what was that like? Um, the only training I had was a PD on a particular curriculum. Like I I have a, a math a single subject math credential which allows me to teach computer science, but I have never taken a official like college course, um, it was a six week PD over summer. So it was still, it was, you know, it was COVID. So it was over Zoom and I would struggle with some of the assignments. I would like send Lisa a screenshot going, please help me. I don't know what's going on. And then um, I would take, I would, you know, watch the YouTube videos from the Harvard CS50 um, program. And I like kind of signed up for that course and I was submitting some assignments when I had the time, you know, between te like trying to figure out Python and figure out C++ and create, that's the hardest part is figuring it out first and then having to try to create the lesson for it. Like, okay, now I think I understand it. How am I going to explain it so that kids can understand it? Because I also recognize that, you know, they're, they're a lot younger than me. So their, their brains may not be, um, you know, thinking the way that my brain has with all the experience that I have. Um, so how can I put it together for them? Um, that's the extent of my certification. <laughs> I would yeah. love to be certified though. I mean, I want to take college classes and learn all this. It's just like putting in the time, like where do I have the time? In the, in the state of California, there's no certification to teach computer science. Your um, credential as a math teacher allows you to teach computer science. So if you have a math credential, you're certified in the state of California. I know there's other states where you have to have a certain computer science, you have to take a computer science test or get a certain um, certification, um, but California doesn't. And in fact, you could have, um, in our district, our computer science classes fall in the math department. So anyone under the math degree can, or the math credential can teach them. Um, but there are some places that you could just have like industrial arts degree a credential and teach computer science as well. So, I mean, I think it would be interesting for there to be some sort of national certification process just so that, for example, like Tara, just kind of like our school just said, hey, you're gonna be teaching the C++ class because um, we need someone to do it and you can do it. Sorry, the you... lights went off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You've been sitting too still for too long. Um, but I think it would be great for there to be a process, um, you know, something with, you know, here's the knowledge you need and there's courses that teachers can take and, you know, you can do it. I know when they um, opened up computer science principles and made it a class, um, I went to like a, I think it was a four day thing, um, four day workshop or institute, AP Institute. And there were teachers in there who, and there was a bunch of us who had been teaching CompSci A. So it was like, okay. But there, I would say three fourths of the people in the institute, like didn't even really understand what programming was. Like they were like art teachers <laughs> or math teachers. And I was like, holy smokes, like, these people know nothing and this four day institute is gonna like 
not really prepare them for this class at all. And um, I thought that was fascinating to me that there was such a big push to get computer science in all the schools that there was just sort of this acceptance that we're gonna have a bunch of teachers who have no idea what they're doing teaching this principals class. Um, you know, obviously there was a lot of curriculum support from like code.org and a bunch of different places, but um, like that sort of idea when we're so strict about other subjects, like in science, you have, in order to teach chemistry, you have to have a chemistry credential. Like if you have a chemistry credential, you can't teach biology. You have to have a biology credential. Like it's very strict. Um, even in math, we have like two different levels. You have to pass two different tests to teach the upper level. Like it's very strict for so many things. And somehow for computer science, we're so wanting to get access into schools that we're just pretty much like throwing teachers in and saying, good luck, teach this. So I would love a national sort of certification process that at least would give teachers some guidance and some courses and some idea of what the heck they're doing before they jump in. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Good or bad? What do you like, mean? <laughs> good or bad that um, we're moving fast and breaking things. Uh, yeah, it's to, both to good and bad. Industry yeah. Term. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's both okay. good and bad. So, yeah, because yeah, I feel like I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here if there was some kind of certification. So I yeah. wouldn't, I wouldn't have had. I don't, I don't feel like when I was going through, you know, getting a, a credential, com computer science wasn't really on my radar. Honestly, like that was to me, that was for the engineers, and that just is mind blowing to me. Like anybody in, in the school of engineering is just like, oh my, you must be really smart. So that wasn't something that I was even remotely thinking about. Um, so I feel like I wouldn't be here if that was the case. And I'm happy that I'm here right now. So I, that I have this opportunity and I can learn this stuff because um, it's fascinating and that's where we're headed as well. And I also love to apply it to you know my other job um, in theater. Like that's really where I can see how this computer science, um, you know, appeals to the masses and like it entertains people and you know we, we have a show that the entire show is run off of a program and I'm like somebody made that program how cool is that like that so many people love it and it's literally just it's a program you know it's it's not actors not to say anything bad about actors but it's like it's tech this whole show is tech and that's really cool mm -hmm. yeah that and I, I think you, you really come with a interesting um, uh, and, and, and sort of, a, I would say, novel um, sort of, um, point of view on that, right? Um, I'm not sure how many other folks can, can, can share that experience. Um, and lastly, um, when it comes to equity um, in CS, uh, and somewhat tangential to the primary topic for today, but um, what are some of the things that, that we should be focusing on? I know it's a really broad question, but um, I, I would imagine maybe you have some specific things on your mind. I think for me, it was just trying to offer different levels of the courses at this high school level that AP ComSci A is not the place to start for a lot of kids. For a lot of kids, it's fine. A lot of kids can jump into CSA and take off. But for a lot of kids, they need a little bit more start in the shallow end. So trying to find the right courses to offer to allow different types of students to be successful. And I'm not expecting every kid who takes our computer programming one to go on and do all of our other classes or even decide this is what they want to do. But I just feel like it's so important for students today to understand this technology that is basically ruling their lives, <laughs> to have some understanding of how this technology works and that they can understand it and play a part and have a voice there 
um, even if they don't become, you know, computer science majors. I also feel like almost any STEM field you're going to go into, you're going to have to know some some programming. You have to know, you know, I have students who go become even biology majors or any kind of science majors come back and say like, I had to do some programming in MATLAB or anything like that. But having a little bit of background is gonna be huge. So just trying to create a spectrum of ways for kids to experience computer science has always been kind of my goal um, to offer this variety of courses. And I still feel like I'm not hitting the mark though, because I still feel like I have we have the same demographic in all of our classes. I mean, Tara, you have computer programming one. Would you say it is mostly boys taking that class? Like we're just not, I don't know how to equitably reach out to kids who might not normally take it. And I've always tried to reach the girls as much as possible. And I always felt like I'm a woman that should help. <laughs> and I, it's like, I still don't, I feel like it's better, but it's still not like, I want it to be 50, 50. And we're not, we're not 50, 50 female, male at all. Like I'm not even close to that. Um, underrepresented groups as well. I feel like um, just trying to reach everybody and make them feel like this is something they can do um, is definitely a struggle and something I'm constantly working at. And I don't have any answers. <laughs> Do you say that there is um, any correlation, positive or negative, um, with CS and let's say the upper level math courses or the upper level um, science courses? I would say that, like I teach um, upper level math, it's 50-50 or even, we might even have more girls in those classes they um, are not shy about taking math or science. I think that they're well represented in the science classes. Um, I don't know what it is about computer science exactly. Because the girls that I do get love it. They really do. And I always thought, well, okay, well, after the first couple of years, those girls are gonna tell other girls and it's gonna grow and it just, like it hasn't, I don't know how to fix that. One year I had a club, we made a club. We couldn't specifically say it was only for girls, but we called it cats, cooking, cookies and coding. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we would meet at lunch and just, I would just have all the girls who were in computer science classes hang out at lunch. We wouldn't even necessarily talk about computer science, just to like have a space for them to like be together and hang out together. And that was kind of fun, um, but it didn't, fix, it didn't, <laughs> it didn't help. I, I loved hanging out with them and having cookies with them and talking about cats and coding, but it didn't grow my girls program. So I don't, I don't know what to do. Do you have some answers, yeah. Sasha? <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I feel like it can be intimidating and that's that's kind of like why I didn't uh, approach it I, I mean I didn't even know what a code looked like so I I don't it wasn't prominent when I was going to school um so but I still feel like you know that whole engineering thing like my dad was an engineer but I'm not <laughs> you know and and maybe because I feel like it's intimidating um so if we can make it seem less intimidating and and more you know user friendly in a sense um that might help but it, you know to, to in order to get it out I, I don't know if we have to like you know do a road show or something it's like look at you can do see <laughs> anybody can do this and if you if you really try and you know i don't know i don't know if that's what it's going to take because it kind of seems like there's a perception um that students have and how do we change that perception that's that's the thing because we work you know we can work in class and and you can reach you know different levels of kids and make them feel successful but that's like isolated to just the classroom how do we get it out so that perception changes and, and more people 
um, feel like they can be successful. I think that's where it might be. It's just the, the feeling of it's a very intimidating thing. Do, do you think that making CS, well, let's say CS1 or CSP um, mandatory graduation uh, would move the needle? I feel like making classes mandatory, then, then you know, you get, you get resistance in the classroom from like, I, I have to be here and I, I don't want to be here. So I don't want to, I don't want to learn this. They kind of like put a wall up. Um, and then, you know, it's hard to be successful there when, when you already don't really want to be present. I feel like we might have to make it more like showing students that how it's going to be applicable to their life, like how it can really help them be a successful adult um, or make their life a little bit easier in some capacity. I don't know how that would be, but some, somewhere where they can see there's going to be a benefit to them and make them interested in wanting to learn it versus you have to do this. That I, I would be afraid of that because I see that in math. <laughs> see. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a little double-edged sword of, like I think what Tara said, if it's a requirement, I feel like then kids resist it in a way, but if they find their way there, you know, I don't know. I mean, we have way more kids in computer science between all of our, in our whole program than mm -hmm. like we've ever had before. Um, so that's great. And I think that's awesome. Um, but again, it's just like, yeah, I want to reach the other kids too, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's definitely something that we're interested in, the coding rooms. Yeah. We hope that to a certain extent by making the actual experience of coding less intimidating that that can yeah. have an impact. But my worry with all these things is that, I mean, you're, that, that's too late, right? <laughs> you're kind of behind the eight ball. You know, if, if you're just making it easier or, or more friendly at that point. And I, I wonder about initiatives like Hour of Code, mm -hmm. but, but and definitely I when love, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love Hour of Code. And um, I mean, I don't, I, there were a couple of years that I really got into it and we actually did like a school-wide Hour of Code. And I, re, I like um, recruited my comp sci kids and we would ha open up all the labs at lunch and kid, we were, the math teachers were offering extra credit and kids were coming in and doing stuff. And um, it was just, it could, I don't know, I just kind of like lost my um, desire to do it. It just was so much work to, to on top of, you know, what we're already doing. Um, but I, you know, I love the idea of Hour of Code. Um, so I think it, like, that's a great thing. Um, and maybe we'll try that again. Now that I have Tara on my team, probably not this year, but um, try to do something with Hour of Code again. Mm -hmm. I'm just always a little worried that like for, you know, I think like sometimes what they do in our code is fun and simple and happy. And then they get to our actual classes and it's a little bit more um, deep. And mm -hmm. that's, that's always kind of my worry. Like, I don't want to like our code is awesome, but I don't necessarily think it's a, like the greatest representation of what you're going to be doing in a computer science class. Mm -hmm. always I definitely I'm really weary of anything that trivializes CS exactly yeah yeah because I feel like to a certain extent it's false advertising and then also I mean there's sort of truthfully you don't know whether or not it's actually um you're, you're doing no harm right I, I think it'd be totally different if you could say for sure um this is good because uh, it, it's definitely not bad <laughs> um so, so, so therefore, um, it, it's probably worth doing. Um, right. But I, 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 I feel like I know for myself, I feel like those things would have discouraged me because I would have thought, oh, this class is going to be really boring. Um, and to a certain extent, like if, if, you, if it does discourage people, so a certain group of people from doing it um, who are maybe already committed or excited about doing it, then that's probably not good. Um, so, so I really wonder about that. 
Did, what, what about um, making CSP a um, prereq for CSA? Is that something well, that you all do? What we what we are doing now is actually our C++ is a prereq for CSA. So I did kind of move in that direction of having it. Like originally, I never had a prereq for CSA, but I felt the C++ was a nice, um, because you can make C++ procedural and do all like, so how we teach C++ is completely procedural up until like the last couple months of school and then baby step into like structures and then into classes. Um, and so they already know loops and if statements and arrays and all that stuff before they ever have to really understand the concept of what is an object and what is a class and how that works. And I found this year, so this is the first year that I have had the kids last year did C++ and now they're doing Java with me. And I have never had an easier year of teaching Java. Like everything that we're doing, like from day one, because we had at the end of last year, we did structures and then we sort of stepped into like a class is just like kind of like a structure, but now we're adding methods. And when we started this year in Java, it was like no issues, like everything just flowed so easily. Like they already had a sense of what a class was. Everything made sense to them. And it's just been beautiful to me this year. Um, and I felt like the C++ class was a place where kids could learn all that procedural stuff and not be intimidated, but like this whole thing hanging over them. Like I had kids in CompSci A who were always like, Miss Ryder, it's April, I still don't really understand what an object is, you know, like, because you're trying to teach that. So um, I felt like kids build their confidence so much more in the C++ class than the AP CompSci A. So I feel like, to me, that's a really great progression. Um, I want, I always, even the kids who took principles, I'm making them do C++. Just because principles, we just don't do a lot of programming. There's so much other topics to do. And the program we do is so minimal that I wanted them to like have a deeper thing. So kids don't have to take principles at our school. They can do C++ to AP CSA, um, principles to C++ to CSA. So we really um, like have that kind of growth there and we're trying to i'm trying to push the c plus plus as more as like you really understand what programming is and you really want to do a lot of programming and principles is like i really have no idea what computer science is like i have no clue at all and that's what i feel like principles is like well we're going to do a little bit of cybersecurity. we're going to do a little bit of how the internet works we're going to do you know ethics and then we're going to do some programming too so then hey did you really like that programming come to C++, you know. Um, not this year, but other years, we have articulated the C++ with our local community college. So they can get um, college credit for it. So that's the way I can, you know, because it's hard to convince some of these honors AP kids to take a class. A lot of times they're like, AP, got to take all the AP classes. So to sort of convince them like C++ is going to be worth your while, we kind of like dangled this, like you could get college credit that way. And um, not th this year we're unable because we don't have time to do the full curriculum that the community college requires. But um, that's been kind of like a big ca uh, carrot to the kids who are looking for that college credit as well. But yeah, like I'll say like this year in CSA is the best year I've ever had with kids, like really, really understanding some of the um, object oriented ideas. And like just the other day I taught like polymorphism and inheritance and um, they are like, yeah, get it 100%. And the past they were like, wait, what? What are you talking about? So I just, I think, uh, I think it's hard to have CSA be your first class for a lot of kids. Sorry, that was a long answer to that. That was awesome. Question. Yeah. If, if I were to um, um, if I were to think about that, I, I think it definitely has something to do with um, sort of strengthening the 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 the, the whatever uh, muscle group is responsible for um, 
dealing with layers of abstraction. Yes. And I, I've definitely found that some of the most um, brilliant people that, that I've uh, been fortunate enough to work with um, tend to be really good at that. Tend to be really good at dealing, um, at, at, at switching between different layers of abstraction, um, mm -hmm. concurrently operating at multiple levels of abstraction and being able to abstract um, purely in the sense that um, di different layers of abstraction don't interfere with each other. Um, right. And, and th that's sort of um, like systems design and, and all those types of things. I, I, I think, I don't know if that's talked about, uh, uh, talked about a lot in teaching circles and, and I might be completely wrong about that, but that's just, that's something I've in, encountered myself personally, at least. I feel like that's one of the great things about the principles class, which I was really wary about at first. And I feel that they kind of have moved away from that, but it seemed like at first there was, that was one of the big ideas was this, was this idea of abstraction and the different levels of, of, of abstraction in different ways. And I, I wish that they would focus more on that and maybe give up some of the other stuff um, because I feel like it's so key. And it wasn't something that I really even understood that we were doing in CompSci A or in any programming language until I taught principles. And I was like, oh yeah, like I see these different levels now um, and understanding that. So I kind of wish that principles would move more into that idea of, a, it seemed like it started there and then it kind of moved away from abstraction a little bit. I mean, there, there's a lot of talk about like abstraction, um, but as far as like really making it a key component, I feel like they moved a little bit away from it. Mm -hmm. I love, I don't know, have you watched any of um, Crash Course Computer Science? Uh, PBS has these video series called Crash Course Computer Science. No, I have not actually. Sasha. And no. she, um, Carrie Ann, I can't remember her last name. She spends, she, she, in almost every video, she, she has this little thing about, and that's another layer of abstraction and mm -hmm. is always talking about that. And I think like, that's just like a huge part of it, of computer science. And it's not something we ever even, like, I don't even, unless you say abstract class in computer science A, like that's not something we teach or really get into in CompSci A, so. Mm, I see, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. we yeah. just kind of go like, here's an object without really discussing like, no, this object is representing something, you know, it's an abstraction of data, it's a data structure or whatever, you know, we don't really, we're just like, this is what an object is. This is what an object does without mm -hmm. really thinking about all those levels. I see. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I think that, that that's something that I, I stumbled upon totally by accident. But then I thought, oh, it seems to be connected to a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think CSP tried to do at first, do like, you know, talk about abstraction of hardware and then abstraction of languages and like it all kind of goes together. And I thought that was really cool and eye-opening, but really deep. It's kind of deep. Maybe that's why they moved away from it because I think it is kind of deep for students to really grasp that idea. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things that, that you almost kind of have to come back to. Then you, you kind of realize yeah, it would have been helpful to know, but hard to know. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, as many hard things in CS. <laughs> Right. Well, I really appreciate your time, uh, Tara, Lisa. Do you have any um, parting words that, that you'd like to uh, share with our listeners? I don't think so. I just um, wanted to thank you guys and Coding Rooms for really um, making this amazing product that you guys made. And I hope that more people discover it and realize that it's really like, it's really game changing in what we're doing in the computer science classroom. And awesome. thank you for doing that. I know that you guys work super hard and um, are doing it with like the best of motives, which is helping us. And I think that's just awesome. And awesome. I just wanted to thank you for that. Thank you so much, Lisa. Really appreciate hearing that kind of feedback.
Um, yeah, as challenging as this year has been, I feel like coding rooms has been, you know, something that has made it easier um, in order to, you know, teach the courses that we need to teach and reach the kids that we um, are teaching in a way that we can actually help them and really see that we are helping them and not just talking to the void. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. just so fascinating. I think as a teacher to grow by watching what students are doing instead of just seeing the end, like so often we just see the end product of what they did and watching the process of what a student is doing and kind of understanding their thought process is like really eye-opening as a teacher to see like, oh my goodness, this is what they think is happening and really like, oh my gosh, why are they doing this weird thing? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. And like, that's really, that's really amazing. That's awesome to hear. I, I, yeah. It's been eye-opening for me to, to be a part of this yeah. journey. So really appreciate that. And, and thank you all so, so much for your time. Yeah. Today. yeah. Thank you, Sasha. Of course. Awesome. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And um, with that, that's the end of our podcast. Thank you for watching and we'll be back again next week. Thank you. Okay. I'm gonna...